Okay, the thing that we're interested in on the rain table is we've got lots of misconceptions. You think that, well, water is simple, you know, it just simply flows downhill. Wherever you put the rain, it's going to go downhill. There's actually a lot of misconceptions about that. Instead. For many students, water flows to the south, no matter what. So across an area like this, the water should all flow inside one direction, regardless of what the topography is. Uh, other students, uh, they'll have it, the water flows towards other water. So a lake is there, or if there's something here where we even, it's sort of interesting, where you have a shaded topographic map, water actually likes shadows in dark areas when the students are trying to predict the path of the water flow. Now, they misunderstand that the shading is just where it's supposed to represent shadows, but instead the water will go along it. Using something like this, you can hopefully find out and realize that water is just simply going to follow the topography, just move down. One of the really nice things about it is it's self-organizing nature. If you just go back and forth randomly, originally the dots just come out wherever you put it, but within a very short time, they coalesce, they find a drainage pattern, they're following the topography down, and then you still have the water flow down, just following the earth's surface, not driven by any other standards. Uh, some of the other misconceptions that this can work on pretty well is that many students don't know what a watershed is. They actually think of it more as a body of water or as a shed of water that's out inside the area. They don't recognize the idea that we're really in a watershed. All you're trying to look at is on an area when it rains, where is the water from one area going to flow? So no matter where we put the water across this and move it down, it's going to end up flowing off down here over the side throughout this broad area. On the other hand, if I move it over just a little bit, I can probably start to get water starting to flow down into other watersheds as well. So there's actually a divide here where if you've got the water on one side of the topographic crest, the water will flow down and exit off the map over here in this direction, but just shift it over slightly and instead it's going to move down and it'll exit all the way off in a different direction. Those are really important questions when it comes to things like pollution, floods, uh, things like that. People wonder, well, why did Katrina happen in the city of New Orleans? Well, if you understand watershed, you realize that you don't need to have a powerful rainstorm around New Orleans to flood New Orleans. You just need a week or two of really powerful storms anywhere within the drainage basin, which is a third of the lower 48 states. So any combination of events up there can create a flood in New Orleans. So where we live up here in Minneapolis, the only thing we have to worry about flooding is just what happens here inside Minnesota, what the snow melt is like, how much rain is falling. But if you live down south at the bottom of the watershed, you've got to pay attention to what's happening through the entire Ohio River Hub Valley system, the Missouri River Valley system, as well as what's happening up in here in Minnesota. It's not enough just to look in your own backyard. So, so those are just some of the things I think the water table can really make a much better job of trying to get students to visualize and understand better than just simply being told the words. They can actually map out a watershed by moving the rain around to recognize that everything within this broad area drains down this, but over here it begins to drain in that direction. When we get over here, it's going to be draining off in that direction. And again, if you have pollution sources here, well, if you had a toxic waste dump here, you have to worry about that toxic waste dump, any spillage coming out all the way down along the river watershed. But you're not going to be affected if you're over in, say, this area. So it gives a slightly better idea of pollutants flow. Uh, it's not so much toxic waste dumps up here, say, Minnesota. Our number one source of pollution from rivers is actually farmers' fields, agricultural zones, and fertilizer and agricultural zones. In the city itself, it's actually the waste inside people's front yards, yard waste. You rake your leaves up and instead of taking a compost pile, you let them go down the sewer system. That's our number one source of pollution in the river. It's very difficult to get people to understand how important it is to try and do things in a little bit more environmentally substantive manner. I think that's about it that we come up with.